This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. During the waning days of Africa's apartheid era, Judge Richard Goldstone led a series of investigations which not only exposed the human rights abuses committed by his own country's security forces, but may have also headed off a full-blown civil war in the process. Judge Goldstone was known back then as the most trusted member of South Africa's white establishment. He was also described by the New York Times as a cross between King Solomon and the Ghostbusters, an arbiter of irreconcilable grievances, the Times said, as well as a stalker of national goblins. Over the next couple years, Judge Goldstone went on to advance the cause of international justice, serving as the chief prosecutor for two war crimes tribunals, one for the former Yugoslavia, the other for Rwanda. Judge Goldstone has had, to say the least, an extraordinary career, and much of that career was recounted in his memoir, published in 2000 called For Humanity, Reflections of a War Crimes Investigator. Judge Goldstone, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you very much. I believe that on uh, more than one occasion, you've acknowledged that it is impossible to take politics out of international justice. In fact, I think you've said that politics is the engine that drives international jurisprudence. So I'm wondering whether that's the same or at least close to the same thing as acknowledging that, uh, that no matter how much idealism and how much integrity judges and lawyers bring to these international tribunals, uh, there's always going to be an element of expedience, perhaps even hypocrisy associated with them. Well, I think one has to separate the judicial job and the jobs of prosecutors on the one hand and the politics on the other. I believe that it's, it's absolutely essential for any justice system, whether domestic or international, to have absolute integrity and impartiality and, uh, and judicial independence and prosecutorial independence. Uh, but having said that, for the, for the uh, international tribunals particular, in, uh, in particular, for them to be established, and perhaps even more importantly, for them to succeed, one has to rely on the political process Without the politics, they wouldn't exist, and without the politics, they couldn't succeed. So within that, certainly there is room for some sort of maneuver. I wouldn't call it expediency, but I would call it being being rational and, and, and taking, t t taking into account on the part of judges and prosecutors uh, and defense counsel for the, same, uh, for the same matter, taking into account the political reality on the ground. Well, I mean, the, la the language of politics is the language of expedience. It's the language of self-interest. And the language of the law is supposed to be the, uh, the language of principle. So how do you reconcile those two paradigms? They seem to be terribly at odds with one another. Well, well, well not really. I think, I think the, the politics that, that intervenes in, in, the, in the work of international tribunals and in the court system generally mm -hmm. uh, is politics with a lowercase p. Mm -hmm. It doesn't turn judges and prosecutors and lawyers into politicians, mm -hmm. but it does make them realize that what they have to live with, in fact, uh, is, uh, is the political system, uh, whether it's domestic or international. 
When I was uh, preparing for this interview, I, I ran into the name of an Indian jurist named R. B. Paul. Uh, as you probably know, uh, he uh, served on the panel that judged the Japanese who stood accused of atrocities during World War II, and and he certainly believed that the defendants before him had, had, had committed atrocities, but uh, unlike his colleagues, he felt that to find those defendants guilty uh, was uh, victor's justice, and he characterized the proceedings as basically politics pretending to be justice. Uh, now, to be fair, his was a lone voice on that court, but did he have a point? Well, well he had a point looking at it from, 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 uh, from afar. Mm -hmm. uh, I think ha having the views that, that he expressed, he shouldn't have sat on that court. Mm -hmm. it, it was inconsistent. Either you, either you uh, accept an appointment to a court and do justice, or you mustn't get involved. Yeah. In a way, he tried to have it both ways. Well, it was uh, you know the decision not to try Hirohi Emperor Hirohito wasn't that a political decision? Well, of course, it was, and the the uh, it, it 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 was the beginning of the Cold War, and the the United States, in particular, didn't want to disaffect all of the people of Japan. So, doesn't that politics? undermine the legitimacy of the court when it intrudes like that? Well, I, don't th I, I, th I think it questions the, not the legitimacy of the court, but the decisions taken by people involved with the court. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think in a domestic situation, similar situations arise. Uh, uh, at the moment, there's a big debate in the United States whether bank, bank executives should be charged uh, sure. with, with, with fraud as opposed to the banks themselves. That's very much a, 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 a political decision, again, and the, with, a lower, with a lower case P. Mm -hmm. But I think all legal systems have to, have to, have to come to grips with this sort of decision and this it, sort it, of it's situation. It's a delicate balancing act, right? Absolutely. But you know, you said, you've said that you were uh, influenced by the Nuremberg trials. Um, and it certainly was uh, satisfying to see th those Nazis uh, held to account. But from a purely legal standpoint, there are real problems with that tribunal, weren't there? Well, there were certainly, um, not, not so much at the time, but, 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 but with hindsight. Uh, in, uh, in hindsight, looking back, there are questions of Victor's justice and uh, ex post facto uh, right. uh, crimes. They, they, and were so on. they were judged uh, by laws that didn't exist at the time that the right, acts in question were being uh, But at the same time, the, the, those, the, those acts were criminal by, by any standards, including the, the laws of Germany. Mm -hmm. so, so what was new was calling them crimes against humanity. Uh, but, but murder and torture and the, these crimes were certainly known by the Nazi leaders to be, uh, to be criminal, uh, to constitute serious criminal conduct. But wasn't the major focus of Nuremberg criminal aggression? And, and, and it's one thing, I mean, and that's another criticism of the Nuremberg trials, that the judging went all one way. I mean, it's one thing to judge the Nazis guilty of criminal aggression for invading Poland, but the question of whether Stalin was guilty of criminal aggression when in 1939 he entered into a pact with uh, Hitler to partition Poland. I mean, that, that question was, was off the table, obviously, right? right? Well, 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 also off the table was, was bombing cities. Sure. Tra and, and targeting exactly. civilians. Exactly. The, 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 those were clearly political decisions. It was that sort of decision that upset Judge Powell, which I understand. Mm -hmm. But what's the alternative? The, 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 should, should the Nuremberg judges have said either, uh, either we're going to be involved in a system where we're also going to put on trial uh, the Allied leaders or we're not going to get involved? I don't think that would have, especially in the, in the, in the atmosphere of 1945, uh, that, that wouldn't have been a good or sensible decision. So is the price of international justice hypocrisy? No, I, I, I wouldn't call it hypocrisy. I think, I think they're, they're, they're to, to an extent, I suppose, might be, might be double standards, but that doesn't, it, it, that doesn't make it uh, a, a dishonest or, 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 uh, or dishonorable proceeding. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a more recent example. Uh, in, in 1999, NATO mounted a 78-day bombing campaign over mm -hmm. Kosovo, uh, which, which did have the salutary f effect <coughs> of ending the ethnic cleansing there, but it was also a campaign that was not approved by the UN Security Council. Uh, it was a campaign that targeted power stations, television stations, and water.
water supplies as well as purely mil military targets, and it was blamed for the death of roughly 500 civilians. And uh, so the question was asked, was that campaign itself illegal? And as I'm sure you know, the two women who succeeded you as chief prosecutor for the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, did look at that question, but they didn't get very far. And they didn't get very far clearly for political reasons. So is that yet another example of how international politics conspires against international justice? No, no, I don't believe so. I think the decision that, uh, that, that, that my successors took with regard to the Kosovo campaign uh, was, was absolutely justifiable, on, on the, not perhaps for the reasons that they gave, but for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Mm -hmm. Firstly, the, 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 the illegality of that campaign was, was illegality at the, at the level of international law. Uh, without a Security Council resolution, and there was no question of self-defense, under the Charter of the United Nations and under international law, uh, it was an illegal m use of military force. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I headed a, uh, an investigation. I know. In, in, After into, you were in, chief in, prosecutor, you headed an investigation right. of that, that campaign. Uh, into the Kosovo campaign. Right. And we, we unanimously, and we had a very representative uh, uh, commission of, 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 of leaders, of leading lawyers and politicians from a number of countries, we unanimously came to the conclusion that the campaign was illegal but legitimate. Yeah, what does that mean in the context of international law? What does it mean to say well, that... Well, it means, it means yeah. in, in, in black letter law it was illegal. Yes. But because of the motivation uh, for, for the use of a military force, which was wholly and solely to protect the lives of innocent uh, Albanian Kosovars, uh, we said it was legitimate. It was morally legitimate, but 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 legally uh, but uh, illegal. That, but is that law then? I mean, if if something is illegal but legitimate, you know, it's can a court say that? I mean, is it, well, well, I mean, we're mixing. But you know, co courts say that all the time. The the sort of example that comes to mind is a husband finding his wife in flagrante uh -huh. in, uh, in the bedroom and and and, and 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 on the spur of the moment, uh, shooting the lover. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the courts of most countries would regard that killing as illegitimate, as, as illegal, but legitimate. Not this country, but we're a little odd uh, that well, way. Certainly in a lot of countries, but, but even in this yeah. country, it would be a strong mitigating circumstance. Sure, sure. Uh, which, uh, so if so. you were to bring a NATO general in before the court to defend this campaign, would, would he invoke the necessity defense? Would, would no, that be? He, no, I don't think so. The, 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 defense, the defense would be... Well, well, certainly the general would 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 have little uh, would have had little option. He he was ordered okay. at the highest level to, right. to, to to do this. But if if, if you brought into court the leaders, if you brought yes uh, 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 President Clinton into uh, into the into the witness box, what would he his defence say? I, I I plead guilty to the use of illegal force, but 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 I'm justifying it on the humanitarian grounds. Uh, for which it was used, and for which, uh, and, and in respect to which, my NATO allies all agreed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and incidentally, the United Nations Security Council, after the event, refused to criticise. So, what does the court do with that? What, what is a a court that calls itself a court? What does it do with the admission that something's illegal, but um, to use your word, legitimate? Well, if the push becomes a shove, then 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 the court would have to find the person guilty, and and but but take into account the strong mitigating circumstances in in imposing an extremely light sentence, if any sentence at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention uh, Carla Del Ponte, who was the third uh, chief uh, prosecutor for the uh, ICTY. Um, like you, she served uh, as uh, the uh, chief prosecutor for the International Cr uh, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, as well as the former Yugoslavia. But unlike you, she was stripped of her responsibility uh, in Rwanda. And as I understand it, the, the, the reason she was stripped of her responsibility is because she pushed a little too hard to investigate not only the Hutu leaders in Rwanda who uh, uh, committed the genocide, but also the current Tutsi leaders who, on their way to stopping that genocide, uh, may have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, albeit in a, on a much smaller scale. Um, was 
taking uh, uh, Miss Del Ponte off the off that court the way she was taken off yet an another example of I don't know you, you reject the word hypocrisy but is is it it certainly seems to me that there's a, a, a strong political element there that undermines the credibility of a court like that. Uh, firstly, I strongly question that that was the reason she was taken. Really? Off. Okay. It's not my understanding of the situation okay. at all. Okay. I uh, understand that she, she, she was taken off because the, the Rwandan government in particular was complaining that they didn't have their own prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And the Security Council decided that that was a legitimate complaint, which, which I think it was. At that time, it became uh, more efficient and politically acceptable to, for, for a wonder not to share a prosecutor with the, with the Yugoslavia tribunal. Mm -hmm. but, but to deal with the substance of the question, um, uh, I believe that, that um, uh, uh, Carla del Ponte uh, sh should have been more public about the decision not to investigate alleged crimes committed by the Rwandan army, the RPF. Uh, um, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have charged. I, it was a very difficult situation. Yeah. The Rwanda government made it clear that if the prosecutor began an investigation into crimes committed by their army, they would stop all cooperation with the Rwanda tribunal. In effect, it would have been the end of that tribunal because yeah. no witnesses would have been available. Well, at what point didn't the government prevent witnesses from going to Tanzania? Well, I'm not sure it got to that point, but it certainly would have had that permanent uh, consequence. Yeah. Secondly, the, the Rwanda tribunal was set up to investigate a genocide committed in 1994. That, that was its main role. And the, the, the crimes alleged uh, to have been committed by the RPF certainly didn't come near to the commission of genocide. Right. They were revenge attacks. Right. If I'd have been in Carlo Del Ponte's position, I would have said, I'm not going to jeopardize my main brief for the purpose of investigating crimes at a lower level. I don't have enough resources, enough courtrooms to investigate crimes at the 9 and 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. The genocides are being investigated. I'm not going to jeopardize the life of this tribunal by investigating crimes at the 3 and 4 level. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that would have been... Uh, that would have been a legitimate approach, certainly one that I would have supported. Mm. It's a pragmatic approach. Absolutely. But then you expose the tribunal to the charge of double standard. Well, well that's why I would have gone public about it and put yeah. it on the table. And if, if the people to criticize it, let them criticize it. Yeah. I, I think if a mistake was made, it was not dealing with this. It was really pushing it under the rug. You, know, you yourself had problems with the government in Kigali. Uh, for one thing, and perhaps this is the major thing, uh, many of the same suspects that you were after, the government in Kigali wanted to try in its courts. Right. And so there was a real power struggle there, was right. there not? Right. Well, 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 there was one in particular with regard to a man called Bagasora. Yes. Uh, who was really the, 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 the arch villain of, of, the, the, of alleged, the genocide. Yeah, the alleged mastermind of right. that genocide. He, he, was, yeah. he, was, he was head of the, effectively, the head of the uh, army. Yeah. And uh, he he was the, the the brains behind the he was the arch organizer of the of the genocide. Right. And he and, was and, in, and the Kigali government wanted to try him. Right. They, they did, and he he was arrested in the Cameroons. Yeah. And uh, uh, both both the uh, Rwanda government uh, and 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 my office um, uh, uh, requested Cameroons uh, to to surrender him. Um, uh, under the Security Council resolution, we had primacy, and therefore we had first call. And you asserted that and primacy uh, very aggressively, uh, absolutely. did you not? Absolutely, and I, I remember a very difficult meeting with the, with the cabinet uh, in Kigali with, uh, at the time of President Bagas. Um, uh, um, um, uh, at the, uh, the, uh, uh, Kagami was then mm -hmm. uh, deputy president, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, President uh, Bazamungu was, 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 uh, chaired the meeting. They wanted Bagasora. Um, firstly, the courts weren't operating in Kigali. They hadn't. They hadn't. They hadn't. They were still at a stage where there were no judges and no prosecutors and no court building. Yeah. But in any event, I said this is the main culprit. We. I, I'm. I'm, all, I'm. I'm the chief prosecutor of an international tribunal uh, set up by the Security Council under Chapter Seven <coughs> of the of the United Nations Charter. Uh, I insist that we charge Bagasora in our court, mm -hmm. and and it was it was a very difficult meeting, but but eventually they had no option but to accept that. Mm -hmm. So when the permanent international uh, criminal court, the ICC, was created in 2002, they embraced this principle of complementarity, 
which says that international justice should be viewed as a last resort only when the, the, the national governments are unwilling or unable to prosecute their human rights uh, abusers. Was their embrace of that principle an acknowledgment that uh, the, jurisdiction, the, the jurisdictional primacy that your tribunals operated by was a bad idea? No, not at all. I don't think, I don't think there's any contradiction at all. Uh -huh. um, the, the, the ICC has, has really the whole world on its, on its radar screen, at least now 122 the, the, the countries have, have ratified, and therefore they uh, they uh, they they all fall within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. In the case of the two ad, so-called ad hoc tribunal for, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the Security Council, against the wishes of the countries concerned, said we are going to set up international tribunals, and uh, those countries didn't want justice in their countries at all. Mm -hmm. So it was a question of the of uh, of these uh, international tribunals with primacy or nothing. I think in Yugoslavia, didn't they want a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Weren't they? In fact, they did have one, didn't they not? No, not not really. I think Bosnia would have liked to have had one, but there wasn't one in Serbia or Croatia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overall, you've been a a big supporter of the International uh, mm -hmm. Criminal Court uh, when it was created in 2002, which has had its own share of problems, certainly, starting with George W. Bush and his administration, uh, which did everything that it could to kill the court before it had a chance to even get off the ground. Now, uh, something like uh, 12 years later, uh, the court is facing a new challenge, this time in Africa, where there's been a growing sense of disenchantment with the kind of justice that the ICC is delivering. Uh, do you think that that's a serious problem for the court? Well, I think it's a problem. How serious it is is another matter. I think, I think, I think one shouldn't generalize and, 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 cause, and talk about Af criticism in Africa. I saw an interesting uh, um, acceptable poll uh, certainly within the last few weeks, indicating that the uh, 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 quite a substantial majority of the people of Kenya uh, support Ke uh, their, their president and, and, and deputy president being put on trial. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't want these trials to be abandoned. And, 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 and I think there's a growing gap in some of these countries uh, between the leadership and the people. Mm -hmm. I, think th I think the leaders who are on trial have got very different uh, uh, but the leaders uh, have been very clear about their growing disenchantment, right? Right. Well, so in some of the African countries. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a, a news clip that uh, dates back to uh, last October when uh, the representatives of more than 50 African nations uh, got together in Addis Ababa uh, to, uh, and they did not talk altogether fondly about the ICC. Let, let's run that clip. The African Union has publicly accused the International Criminal Court of hunting Africans because of their race. The accusation was made as the AU summit drew to a close in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. African leaders oppose the ICC's pursuit of Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta on charges of crimes against humanity. The process ICC is conducting in Africa has a flaw. The intention uh, was to avoid any kind of impunity and uh, so ill governance uh, and the crime. Uh, but uh, now the process has degenerated into some kind of race hunting. The ICC insists that it's an impartial body and is determined to continue with its case against President Kenyatta and others in Africa. Former Ivory Coast President Laurent Gbagbo is currently on trial and another ICC target, Sudan President Omar al-Bashir, defied an international arrest warrant to attend the summit in Addis. The ICC has charged Bashir with genocide over the conflict in Darfur. <laughs> 
I, I, you know, I do think the claim that's made that the ICC is an inherently racist organization is, is silly on the face of it. Uh, but there is this inconvenient fact, is there not, that since its creation, uh, the, the court has mounted exactly eight investigations, and every single one of them has been uh, uh, in, on an African c country. And that can't be because all of the uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity that have occurred in the world over the last 12 years have only occurred in Africa. So what's the explanation for that? Well, the explanation is, 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 is a little bit complex, but first of all, of the eight situations, all in Africa, mm -hmm. um, three of them came as a result of requests from African governments themselves. Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the Central African Republic all requested uh, each of them requested the ICC to investigate situations in their countries. Although Uganda changed its mind, right? But, but that, that, that's, that's see where, <laughs> where, where, okay. where they came from. Yeah. U Uganda's been changing its mind going, going every which way. Right. At the moment, I'm not sure that it's not happy to have it there, but that's, that's another matter. Yeah. Th that, that's for three. Two of them came from the Security Council, Sudan and Libya. Mm. were not chosen by the ICC. They were chosen for the ICC by the Security Council. Um, the, the other three came from, from the prosecutor. But what I think was very sensible, the, uh, the, the present chief prosecutor, um, uh, Fatou Ben Souda, um, has very recently issued a very full document dealing with all of the situations that are being investigated that haven't yet been charged. And they involve situations in Latin America, in Asia, um, Afghanistan, Colombia, and mm -hmm. a number of other countries. And, and the, the investigations that have been, invest have, have been put in place up to date are, are, are described. And I really uh, challenge anybody to, 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 to say that, yes, the, the International Criminal Court should have got involved before now, uh, or even now. Uh, with, with with those particular situations. So it's an unfortunate fact. Mm. One has to recognize that I understand the perception of many Africans, and I speak as an African. Yes. But the, I understand the perception of Africans who object to the fact that only African situations have come before the court. And certainly, as a supporter of the court, uh, I will sleep happier at night when there's some non-African situations before the court. Yeah, Yvette, hasn't your own country's government expressed some of that same disenchantment? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, well no, not on that score. I think, I think the South African government, which has always been a very strong supporter of the ICC, uh, has raised objections to, 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 to sitting leaders uh, being before the court. I think that, that's really the, the, the main criticism that has come from South Africa. One uh, commentator writing about the ICC some time ago uh, made this observation. He said, quote, the ICC's true tragedy is that it is a court that cannot conceivably exercise political jurisdiction over great powers, creating a permanent two-tier justice system in which strong states use global institutions to discipline the weak. Would you agree with that? Well, uh, that's a fact of life. I think one, one can't disagree with it, that those are the facts. Yeah. The International Criminal Court is unlikely in the foreseeable future to be investigating uh, war crimes committed either by the United States, Russia, or China. It, it does seem to me that the people who are in the business of advancing international justice you know, are in something of a no-win situation. And, and the reason I say that is because, you know, just as often as tr uh, tribunal prosecutors are accused of letting politics get in the way of justice, uh, they are, it seems to me, at least as likely to be accused of letting their sense of justice uh, get in the way of peace negotiations, right? I mean, the ICC has been accused of that in Uganda and Sudan, and, and for that matter, as chief prosecutor, you were accused of that on a Occasion, uh, you know how, how serious an accusation is that? <laughs> well, you know, I don't believe that, that 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 prosecutors should be driven by that sort of consideration. Firstly, a prosecutor doesn't have the information. A prosecutor is not not a party to to to, to peace negotiations. Um, and secondly, it's not his or her job. Uh, I was criticized uh, in particular with regard to the first of two indictments that I issued against Karadic and Manadic. Um, the first was, was, was uh, during the war, 
and the then Secretary General of the UN, Butrus Butrus Ghali, was very critical. He said, he said to me, how on earth can you consider, and this was after the indictment was issued, I didn't consult him, he said, how could you consider issuing an indictment during the war? Mm. We're trying to bring peace to the area and you indict Kuroditch. Yeah. And I said, well, that's what I've been told to do by the Security Council. And, of course, he didn't know, and I didn't know, that within a very few months, th that indictment enabled peace to be negotiated by, uh, by, by uh, uh, Richard Holbrook at Dayton. Had Karadich not been indicted, he would have been entitled to be at Dayton. Had he gone to Dayton, the, Bosnia, the, the Bosniak leaders, uh, then President Izzet Begovic, wouldn't have been seen dead in the same room as Karadic two months after the massacre, the genocide at Srebrenica. But because he was under indictment, Karadic would have been arrested had he gone to Dayton. He had to ironically be represented by Milosevic and a peace, peace was negotiated and that was the end of the war uh, and the guns have remained silent until today. So there, justice assisted peace. I didn't know it would and Butrus Ghali didn't know it would. But it, I think is, is, is the sort of situation that, that, that drives me to say that, that, uh, that, that, that prosecutors shouldn't take those political considerations into account. But what if you indicted Milosevic himself? I mean, there are those who suspect that uh, you uh, held off indicting absolutely, Milosevic. Absolutely untrue. I would have loved nothing more to, uh, than, than, than to indict Milosevic. I mean, it, it really is, is, is quite a ridiculous suggestion. Mm -hmm. and, but, but, and, and, and Louise Arbour was criticized when she had enough evidence and did indict Milosevic. She, yeah. she was criticized. Yeah. You were con very concerned, were you not, though, that in 1995 uh, the Clinton administration was going to use amnesties as a bargaining chip uh, in its peace negotiations with Milosevic in Dayton. And in fact, didn't you do everything in your power to try to discourage that? Yeah, absolutely. It seemed to me to be inconsistent with the whole uh, purpose and, 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 and mandate and philosophy of having the Yugoslavia tribunal for, uh, to, to, to have it being used as a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. and, and I said as much during Dayton in an interview I had with the New York Times. Mm -hmm. But well, let me ask you this. In your mind, is it entirely inappropriate for international prosecutors to factor into their indictment decisions the impact that any one of those decisions might have on a peace process? Is that, in your view, entirely inappropriate? Well, we're not only inappropriate for, for the reason I've given, I don't believe the prosecutor will ever have the sort of information that, that would entitle him or her uh, to, avoid during his, uh, to avoid doing his or her uh, duty. Uh, prosecutors are, appo are appointed to prosecute. I mean, if you take a domestic example, mm -hmm. um, uh, b b b b prosecutors at the time of the impeachment of uh, President Nixon um, um, might have said, you know, this is not a good idea to, to impeach the president. What's the rest of the world going to say about mm -hmm. it? Uh, we, we, we should forget about it, and uh, at least while, while he's in office. It's the sort of same political, you know, I, 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 the, the point I'm making is I don't believe that prosecutors in domestic situations are really in a very different situation in these politically high-powered situations uh, in deciding whether to indict or not to indict. Well, first of all, I mean, I think everyone has incomplete information, right? It's hard to know exactly what's going to happen at any given moment with all the variables. But, but, but let me just read a, you know, a quote that you gave in, back in 2007 uh, that is uh, on point here. You said, quote, if you have a system of international justice, you've got to follow through on it. If in some cases, if in some cases that's going to make peace negotiations difficult, that may be the price that has to be paid. Hmm. And, you know, I have to say, when I read that quote, I thought to myself, well, you know, that's an easy thing to say from the comfort of one's office, say, in Holland. But if you're in a country that has seen years of war in which, uh, and you're still in constant danger of being raped or tortured or, or murdered, that's not a sentiment that you're likely to uh, uh, view as particularly compelling. Well, but, but it's not, you know, I think one's got to look at it holistically and say what's in the interest of the greatest number of victims. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly my, my, my view, and I hope I can be objective about it, is that 
the work of these tribunals have generally been received well by victims. I think that the, the, the countries of the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda are, are infinitely in, a be, in, in better shape than they would have been without the work of those tribunals. But you can certainly give examples here and there where yeah. they may have exacerbated yeah. this or that situation. One's got to look at the whole picture. I mean, there is a paradox here. I, I, I think certainly the threat of international justice can deter a genocidal monster. But at the same time, it seems to me that the certainty of international justice could just as easily uh, motivate a genocidal monster to fight to the last man. I mean, I, it's rather paradoxical, I, I, I is it not? I accept that absolutely. And, uh, but, but the question one has to ask at the end of the day yeah. is, are we a better world for having international justice than we would be without it? Is, is impunity for, for, for the most serious war crimes a better option than having a system of justice where at least some of them are going to come before the court? In your own country of South Africa, there was certainly in the mid-1990s a, a choice to be made. On the one side, there were those who wanted a blanket amnesty for all of those who had committed human rights abuses in defense of apartheid. And on the other side, there were those who wanted a series of Nuremberg-type trials. What your country got, of course, was kind of something in between with its Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, chaired by Desmond Tutu, which in essence uh, offered amnesty to those who offered a full and truthful accounting of what they had done. I I'm wondering, as, as a person who had spent so much much time in other parts of the world chasing human rights uh, abusers uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, uh, people who had committed crimes against humanity. Uh, did your country's decision to trade amnesty for the truth uh, seem like the right decision to make? Well, certainly at the time it did. Um, you, you correctly. Um, portray the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, really it was a compromise between the two poles. Mm -hmm. uh, during the negotiations, if, 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 the, if, if Mandela and his uh, comrades had insisted on Nuremberg-style trials, de Klerk wouldn't have negotiated, wouldn't have agreed. It, it, was, it was amazing enough that he was giving up power to an oppressed majority uh, to, to have also agreed to, uh, to, to he and his friends going to prison in the, uh, in, in the, in the, at the end of it would have been um, impossible. Um, on the other end, Mandela just wasn't prepared to, to forget the past and have, as he called it, some sort of historical amnesia. Um, and, and, and he wouldn't have agreed to that. So, so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was both a political and a moral compromise. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what is so far unique amongst the many truth, truth and Reconciliation Commissions that there have been around the world, South Africa is unique in having used amnesties as a carrot um, to, get, uh, to, to get at the facts and to get full confessions um, using the stick of prosecutions on the other hand. So we had both prosecutions and the threat of prosecutions on the one hand and amnesties, discrete amnesties as you correctly suggest for uh, in return for full, full and truthful confessions and it worked well and I think uh, so certainly I was always and have remained a great supporter of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think the, the biggest gift that's given to my country is that we have one history of what happened during the apartheid era. Without the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we'd have had at least two histories. Mm -hmm. We'd have had the, the, the history of the victims, which would approximate the truth. The black victims know what happened to them. And you would have had, uh, by and large, white denials based on the fabrications that, that many people believed and they were put out by the apartheid government. Right. So you had this unique set of variables that resulted in these hearings that were televised. Okay. And they were rather extraordinary, if only because they showed in real time uh, the tortured uh, uh, confronting their torturers. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a short clip that I think gives some hint as to how uh, wrenching some of those confrontations were. Let, let's run that clip. I remember saying to me that you are able to treat me like an animal or like a human being and that how you treated me depended on whether I cooperated or not. I can't remember it correctly, sir, but I would concede I may have said it. Can I then also just ask if you remember that 
while I was laying on the ground that somebody inserted a metal rod into my anus and electric or shocked me. No, sir. It's not true that you and Corson assaulted me throughout the trip. If you say we assaulted you in the combi, then I would concede that in all probability I did. Let, let's suppose for a moment that uh, one day a, a Bosnian Serb comes up to you who had been imprisoned at The Hague as a, as a result of the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, ICTY's uh, uh, jurisprudence. And let's say he asked you to explain to him why was it that he was targeted for retribution when people in your own country uh, who did uh, things that were perhaps just as bad, maybe even worse, not only were not punished, but even got to keep their government pensions. What, 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 would, you, what would you say to him? Well, I would, I would explain the different situations and, and, and the different crimes. I'd try and explain the, the political differences in particular. Um, and to say it may be that there should be universality and there should be a, a commonality of investigations and prosecutions and punishment, but that's not the perfect world that we live in. And uh, and 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 he, I would explain that 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 on your on your example, he would be saying, I admit that what I did, uh, I admit I did it. I'm guilty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would I would say, well, then you know you shouldn't complain that you're being punished in in the interest of the victims. But there's no, I, you know, I'm just putting myself in the role of this Bosnian Serb, and I think is, you know, uh, the, the response he would likely give is, but it's such a double standard. Well, and you would say, say that's yes, life? That's correct. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the, world, the world we live in. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, I, and I tell him that many people who have committed worse crimes than he is are walking free in many countries. What about the people who didn't participate in that TRC process, who did not get amnesty? It's not as if there was a lot of follow through on that, was no, there? I agree. I think it's one of the major criticisms, if not the major criticism, uh, of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, 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 Commission policy, and that was that the government didn't follow through with, with, with a number of prosecutions that, that were recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation. Right. They, I think they gave uh, your uh, National Prosecuting Authority 300 names. Right, and, nothing, and I think virtually nothing virtually happened. Virtually none result. of them were prosecuted. And I think, I think in a way, it was, it, 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 it was unfair on many who came forward. Mm -hmm. They came forward in the belief they'd been prosecuted. I think many of them must be kicking themselves now for saying, you know, if I'd have called their bluff, I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have sought an amnesty and I wouldn't have been prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Which is only going to make that Bosnian Serb that I described even more upset, right? right. <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think it's an answer because there can't be justice for all doesn't mean there should be justice for none. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to have you talk a little bit about your background. Uh, you, you were born and raised in an upper middle class, all white suburb near Johannesburg. Uh, your parents were liberal, uh, non-religious Jewish people, which in a rough sort of way describes the parents that I had growing up in suburban Boston. Although I would have to say that my parents were not entirely uh, uninfluenced by the racist attitudes that surrounded them. I mean, my father, for example, uh, was not adverse to uh, using the N-word on occasion to describe black people. Uh, were your parents entirely uncontaminated by yeah, the I bigotry think, I think that... I what you've described would apply to my parents. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Except uh, certainly in the case of my father. My mother was much more progressive and much more f felt much more s uh, strongly uh, against any form of racial aggression or uh, racial oppression uh, 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 or racism, but of course we were all we were all affected by the societies in which we live, yeah. in which we were born and grew up. But you went on to become an anti-apartheid activist as a college student. Mm -hmm. Was there an experience that led you to that activism? It was. It was really meeting for the first time, meeting peers, uh, black peers. Mm -hmm. And, and, and realizing at first hand, face to face, uh, the, the, the terrible unfairness of racial, uh, of, of, of racial oppression and comparing the life I led uh, as a privileged white uh, compared to my equals uh, 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 equally oppressive uh, situation because of the color of his skin. Could your father understand that? Um, not as much as my mother. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you went to law school, and after law school, you built a, a very successful commercial law practice. And then in 1980, you made what you have described as one of the most difficult decisions of your career, which was to accept an appointment as a judge on a South African high court, mm -hmm. uh, which obliged you by oath to uh, uh, to uh, preserve and protect, uh, well, obliged you by oath to uh, enforce the laws that were designed in many cases to preserve and protect this awful apartheid system, mm -hmm. right? So, but you took that job anyway because you felt you could do some good within the system, right? So in that role, uh, were you able to uh, remain entirely faithful to your values, uh, to your sense of morality, and at the same time, uh, not violate that oath? No, to an extent not, because my, my um, um, primary obligation and duty, and I didn't, I didn't shirk that, was to, was to apply the law in terms of, in terms of my oath. Uh, but having said that, there were many cases and many situations where I could um, uh, ameliorate, if not reverse, some of, those, some of the effects of those laws uh, in the interests of uh, black South Africans, and that, that was... Uh, that that was the situation that 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 was faced by a number of my colleagues. Um, my, my my role model was uh, John Didcot, who was really the first anti-apartheid judge to be appointed during the apartheid system. About five years before I was offered an appointment, mm -hmm. um, and he delivered some really outstanding, uh, trailblazing decisions, um, w which ameliorated the apartheid laws. And uh, he and and others, including myself, were, were encouraged by many of our friends who were involved uh, in bringing uh, cases for black South Africans before the courts to, uh, to take an appointment. Mm -hmm. So w it, it was possible to be an anti-apartheid, apartheid judge? Yeah, absolutely, and I think a number of us were exactly that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to move ahead to your work as the chairman of what was called the Standing Commission of Inquiry regarding the prevention of public violence and intimidation, which quickly became known as the Goldstone Commission. Uh, you held that position for three years, mm -hmm. and in that position you led more than 40 investigations uh, into political violence that threatened to sabotage your, con your country's transition to uh, majority rule. Uh, it's fair to say, is it not, that that was rather dangerous work for you? Well, it was. There, there were serious death threats at, uh, at, at one point. Um, from, from, it started in 90, at the end of 1991, in the middle of 19, from the middle of 1992, for about eight, eight years, I had 24-hour-a-day um, uh, security. So, so you were one of the most heavily guarded people in South Africa. Well, were you I not? wouldn't. I wouldn't say that in, in, in comparison to <laughs> to either Mandela or de Klerk, uh -huh. but, but certainly I had. And wasn't there security. a death threat against your your wife as well? Well, well, that's, you know, no, no, no um, uh, particular threats were made against her, but yeah. obviously a way to get at me would be to get at her. Yeah. I read that uh, during this period you had weekly meetings with Nelson Mandela. True. Yeah. Did you get to know him very I well? I got to know him very well. We used to have long chats on, a, on many a Sunday evening on a one-on-one -on -one basis at his home in Johannesburg. So is he a saint? Well, you know, I don't believe anybody's a saint, but he's certainly the most outstanding, by far the most outstanding person I've ever been privileged to get to know. You also knew F.W. de Klerk, right? Yes, he, but not, not to the same, not, to the, not, not with the he, same. He appointed intimacy. you to that commission, did he Correct. not? He was kind of like the Mikhail Gorbachev of South Africa, and Nelson Mandela was kind of the George Washington. From your vantage point, did you gain any particular insight into how that relationship worked? Well, well I had no doubt from, from the discussions I had with each of them. I was never with them together. Mm -hmm. But from what I learned about them, they, they, they didn't like each other at all. But they respected each other. And mm -hmm. crucially important in this sort of negotiation, they both knew and accepted that each could deliver what he promised. Mm -hmm. And I, I can think of nothing more frustrating than to be in a, in, a, in a difficult negotiation, not knowing whether the person you're negotiating with can ever deliver. Yeah. 
uh, but but both both had a, a trust in the integrity and the word of the other, and that that that's all you need in that sort of negotiation. I noticed as recently as 2012, the clerk was quoted in the press as saying that Mandela was a brutal and unfair political opponent. Uh, so that kind of underscores your point that th they didn't like each other, and, and for that matter, Mandela made no secret of his belief during the transition that the clerk was personally responsible for many of those human rights abuses, right. a charge that at the time you characterized as unwise, unfair, and dangerous. I don't believe that de Klerk was, 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 was consciously aware whether he should have been is another question, but I don't believe he was aware uh, that the, the so-called third force um, uh, operations were going on during the negotiation period. Was, do you think he was at all aware of the human rights abuses that were going on? In no, of course, I mean, that, 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 was, that was well documented and well known, but, 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 but I have little doubt that, that he didn't approve of them at that time. Mm -hmm. To the clerk's credit, uh, unlike his predecessor, P.W. Botha, he did agree to testify before that Truth and Reconciliation right. Commission. We have a short clip from that testimony, as well as a reaction to that testimony from the Commission's chairman, uh, Desmond Tutu. Let's, let's play that clip. There were at all times general rules and guidelines. And the general rules and guidelines within my total experience of how the country was governed, also in the period when I was an ordinary minister, was that we were not above the law. That was the ethos of our approach. The recent information of atrocities I find as shocking and abhorrent as anybody else. It came to me as just a shocking a revelation as to anyone else. Afterwards, truth commissioners expressed their deep disappointment with the National Party attitude. To make that apology and then to negate it by, I mean, the, the way that, I, I, I feel sorry for him that, I mean, maybe he didn't know. But he, 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 didn't, he didn't know. I told him, and people were killed. We went and told them. I mean, to tell me that he didn't know. I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad because I, I, I had hoped that uh, maybe he didn't know. No, maybe he didn't know. So, with the benefit of almost 20 years' hindsight, do you think the clerk told the truth that day when he testified before the Truth and Reconciliation well, it, it, it's Commission? It's a question of degree. Of course, um, de Klerk must have been aware, certainly during the apartheid period, he was one of the leaders of the apartheid government. And uh, he, he, uh, he was, I've no doubt, aware of the human rights violations that were being carried out. But, by the same token, I've got no doubt that uh, when the transition period began, mm. uh, he gave orders that that was to stop. It didn't stop, but I don't believe that was, uh, that, that was something that, that was um, uh, uh, known to de Klerk. I think, I think he turned a blind eye to a lot of it. Mm. I think he had the wherewithal to find out, and I think that, 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 that when our commission, for example, uh, f f found, found conclusive evidence uh, that, that senior members of the police and the army were, were still continuing uh, to ferment violence and were responsible for, uh, uh, for terrible crimes against humanity. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think he was shocked about that. And the reason I don't, uh, the, the reason I came to that conclusion was I don't believe he would given, have given me the powers. And they increased during, during the course of our investigation, uh, had he known. Yeah. And uh, my, my, my what, what I think um, uh, Archbishop Tutu was, 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 was upset about was that um, de Klerk really apologized for the fact that apartheid didn't work. There was no moral um, um, underpinning uh, to, to his apology.
And, and, and I, too, found that a disappointment. So I guess to characterize his testimony, though, this is all about truth. I mean, that was the whole idea. Mm -hmm. Did he tell the truth? Did he stretch the truth? Did he lie at times? I mean, how would you characterize that you testimony? Know, I think, no, I don't. I, I wouldn't be able to put it in those rather simplistic terms. Yeah. I don't think he was lying. I think we're talking about value judgments. I think he should have taken greater responsibility than he did for the crimes that were committed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before we conclude, I, I do want to ask you about the role that you think the United States has played in advancing international justice. Uh, let me read you a quote from uh, Michael Ignatov, uh, who uh, was uh, a leader of C Canada's Liberal Party. Uh, he said, quote, from Nuremberg onward, no country has invested more than the United States in the development of international jurisdiction for atrocity crimes, and no country has worked harder to make sure that the law it seeks for others does not apply to itself. Would you agree with that characterization? W when I agree with the first part, I think the second part, I think he, he, uh, he may be going uh, to, 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 to too far an extreme. Mm -hmm. But certainly no other country has done anything approaching the amount that the United States has uh, for the advancement of international justice, from the setting up of the uh, uh, Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, for the other tribunals that have followed, and now uh, for the International Criminal Court. And I know that at, uh, from, from first-hand experience. Uh, but the United States has this uh, ambivalence. Um, it, 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 we call it exceptionalism. Well, it is, it is exceptionalism, <laughs> but, but it, 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 it's, it's really, it, it, it's, it's exceptionalism that, that, that's really on the basis that international justice is a terrific idea. As long we as support it, we'll pay for it, but we don't want to be, it's good for you, the rest of the world, leave us out of it. Some would call that hypocrisy. Uh, no, I, it's not hypocrisy. I think, I think it's the politics of the situation, um, and, and, and this is not a party political issue. I believe if, if, if the Rome Treaty was put to the United States Senate, it would be, uh, the, the, the advice would be pretty overwhelmingly against the United States ratifying the Rome Treaty on a, on a bipartisan basis. Mm -hmm. It's going to take many years for that to be overcome. Yeah. I'm hopeful that eventually, probably not in my lifetime, uh, that, 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 that that's going to be changed. Well, because you are an authority in international law, let me ask you this. Uh, George W. Bush, in his memoir in 2010, acknowledged that he approved of waterboarding. And he went further and he said that he would do it again under the same circumstances to save American lives. So under the Convention Against Torture, which the United States has both signed and ratified, does that make George W. Bush an admitted international outlaw? And under that convention, does President Obama have an obligation, if the, for, the, if the first part of that is true, to uh, send former President Bush to a place that is willing to try him if, as, long, as long as this country is unwilling or unable to do so? Well, that, that's certainly the effect of the United States, as you put it correctly, ratify, having ratified the yeah. Torture Convention. Yeah. The, the only issue would be the extent to which waterboarding uh, is a crime under the Torture Convention. Yeah. And, uh, and how, in, in my view, undoubtedly it is. Other people have different views. But, but if it is, if it is a violation of the Torture Convention, then the United States has, a, has an obligation to, uh, to, to investigate it and, if the facts justify it, to, to indict. Is there a, 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 a reasonable argument to be made that waterboarding is not torture? No, not in my view. I've, I've, got, I've got absolutely no doubt that waterboarding constitutes torture. Mm -hmm. Final question, are, are you optimistic about the future of international law? I am. I think, I think the, the, uh, the international criminal justice, international criminal law has advanced in an amazing fashion in the last 20 years. Nobody could have imagined that we would be today where we are. So it's, it's developed a huge momentum. It's not an easy road. There are going to be some roadblocks and detours, but I believe the road's going to continue. Judge Goldstone, thank you so much. Thank you.